Okay, good. It is okay, good. So let me start. Um, so this is my first online teaching. I don't know how many of you have, you know, were registered to any online courses or remote courses before. This is truly my first remote teaching and first online teaching. So thank you for your understanding. Like if you know, if anything goes wrong technically or whatever, you know, thanks for your understanding in advance. Uh, we are going through hard times, as you all know, but hopefully we will go through it. Uh, and the university, you know, announced, as you all know, that the administration has already announced that uh, even after spring break, classes are going to continue at least for the first week after spring break on a remote basis. Uh, so, and unfortunately, as you all know, our group presentations are going to start uh, the week after spring break. So what I am planning to do is, so in the week after spring break, actually I was supposed to present a paper, which I'm gonna do in our remote class after spring break. And then there was one group of one uh, who was supposed to present a paper. So that presentation will also take place. So apparently you can also, you know, join this uh, remote class with your cameras, video camera. So you are gonna do it that way. But of course the issue is, uh, two weeks after the spring break, group presentation starts. Like you know, you are gonna, you are, you were supposed to present as groups of three, four students. Now, I cannot require you, per university regulations, I cannot require you to come together and make make the presentation from one single location. Of course, if you want to come together and want to do the presentation, you know, with your group, you can do that, but you don't have to. So what we are gonna do is that uh, I will relax one of the requirements of the presentations that was remember. Uh, I told in advance that the order of the presentation, the order of presentation is going to be determined randomly at the day of presentation. I will be relaxing this, relaxing this requirement. So what you are going to do is that suppose, you know, you are a group of four and you have, I don't know, 32 slides prepared, let's say for your presentation, then, you know, you can join this uh, call online and, you know, from your individual homes, you don't have to come together, even though you can, if you want to, as I said, and then, you know, each of you, each group member may present a portion of the uh, presentation to everyone else in the, in the remote call. So that is how we are going to proceed if the university will continue with remote teaching two weeks after spring break, where these, you know, group presentations are going to start, basically. So but we'll see, you know, I'm going to let you know how we will do that, how we will proceed. And also at some point, maybe, you know, we may also have to think about how to... Um, you know, uh, organize the quizzes remotely, <laughs> which is also another challenge. But uh, so of course, you know, in that case, it's going to be take home quizzes, basically. So you are going to be given a, a specific amount of time, let's say, you know, generally in the quizzes, as you know, I give you 10 to 15 minutes or up to 20 minutes in class. In this case, I think we are going to be doing it, I don't know, I'm going to give you slightly more time so that you have enough time to scan your quiz and send it or submit it through courseworks. So we are gonna be also, you know, dealing with that that way. And then, you know, hopefully it's not gonna continue until the final exams, but it, if it does, uh, we will also, you know, do something about the final. Of course, in that case, most likely the final is gonna be also in the form of a take-home exam. But, you know, I, I will give you more announcements later on on this. So these are all the bureaucratic sort of announcements, basically. So if you have any sort of particular questions, regarding to the organization of remote classes or you know the bureaucracy of all these don't hesitate to contact me you can actually if you have some urgent question you can write it down to the chat right now or you can turn on your camera and share it you know with us but if not if it is not urgent just email me okay and if i believe that it's sort of you know is a, is a general concern which you know that more than one student may be wondering about i will be making an announcement uh, through courseworks uh, okay, so far so good. Now, um, so today, even though we, you know, have one hour, like, you know, 40 minutes or so class time, uh, I, most likely, you know, it's going to be, you know, it, it's not going to last that long. Okay, so it's the first remote class. I don't know how it's going to, how long it's going to last, but definitely not for one hour and 45 minutes. And, you know, generally we are giving a few minutes of break. We are not going to do that in the remote class, but, uh, so, you know, I don't know. I, I, I will just sort of talk about all these four papers, somewhat more about specific of them, like my paper uh, particularly, as well as the original quid pro quo paper. 
But I will also spend some time about this border puzzle and the David Weinstein's QJE paper. Uh, as you might all know, again, like I have uploaded all these papers to Courseworks. You have access to these papers. Uh, you know, you have, and I know that you have ex you have an exam on Thursday uh, by Ron Miller, uh, and then you also I think have an exam with Iresema Alonso after spring break, which was postponed to after spring break. So maybe some of you did not have a chance to look at those papers. That's okay. Uh, I will basically you know shortly summarize those papers and you know why and. I will also try to explain why I believe they are relevant to uh, you know, in an international economics class, you know, inter international economics course. Okay, so now I hope all of you now see this PDF file. So I have opened four PDF files here, as you can see. Uh, you know, each of them corresponds to a paper. I will start discussing first the uh, the QG paper by uh, Broad and Weinstein. As you might know, that David Weinstein is actually a professor of economics uh, at Columbia in our department. Um, and I think he was on leave in fall. I, I don't know whether he's still on leave in sabbatical leave in spring. He was in London, if I'm not mistaken, in fall. Maybe he's back right now. Um, but this is a really a nice paper. And I think, you know, it's a very right, you know, sort of right time to discuss it in our course, particularly in our course, because we just sort of have finished discussing this uh, Krugman's model, uh, where you know, taste for variety was quite important. It was basically entering into the utility maximization problem. Like you know, that's actually how uh, Krugman initiated incorporating um, intra-industry trade as well as you know trade between two similar countries into the trade theory with the, you know introduction of the new trade theory. Uh, and this is an empirical paper, even though it has some sort of theoretical pillars as well. Those of you who have read it. Um, you know, it's mostly an empirical paper that sort of the most important contribution of this paper, at least, you know, that's what I think is the empirical uh, aspect uh, where they, Christian Broad and David Weinstein basically uh, estimate the gains from having access to this variety due to the, you know, opening up to trade, for example, or, you know, increasing trade exposure. And they do it using US data uh, and so I, when I read this paper, like I read this paper a while ago, but I read it again before this class uh, on Monday and basically highlighted sort of parts of the paper, which I believe are, you know, more important, not more important, but, you know, they sort of explain what the main contribution is quite well. So we may just, you know, go through it like that way, sort of, it might also be helpful, you know, for you to see how generally economists read papers, academic papers. So I just, you know, want to sort of highlight all these sort of things that I just have highlighted using, you know, this, when I right click and then, uh, you know, when I select a text, hide, uh, right click and highlight text in PDF, you can highlight specific parts of a paper. Um, now what you see here is that, so it's basically, you know, an empirical contribution to the Krugman's, the Krugman's theoretical contribution. And it's basically like, you know, empirical extension of Krugman's theoretical contribution, where uh, taste for variety is an important factor, and um, you know they estimate how important it is, whether it's sort of you know really you know increased welfare in U.S. Uh, because you know when U.S. So U.S. economy since you know since the beginning of 20th century is more and more exposed to international trade, and that exposure, that you know increase in the exposure, it also increased you know the the variety of goods that are pouring into US that US is importing from other countries as well as exporting to other countries as well. And now that sort of the goods coming in in more variety, did it increase the US welfare or the, you know, the welfare of US consumers. And uh, so the main contribution as actually you know, in the last sentence of the sort of that number, you know, that estimated number is in the last sentence of the abstract, which basically says, you know, it's around, you know, from 1972 to 2001, the change is more or less equal to the 2.6% of GDP, which is not negligible, as you can see. Of course, maybe it's not as high as you, you know, expected maybe in the first place, but, you know, it is still very significant. The 2.6% of US GDP is quite significant. Um, so then the paper starts, you know, with a motivation, like, you know, why they are doing this study. Like, by the way, like this, this paper is published in Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is 
one of the top five journals of the profession, profession as you might know. So it's you know an important paper, and you know it's uh, really a good contribution. Otherwise, it would not be published there. Um, and what you can see is that so they are using disaggregated U.S. import data. So disaggregated means it's not like you know what is the sort of oh there is a question in the chat forum. Is that 2.6? So Benjamin asks, is that 2.6% in 2001 or over the time period? It's going to become clear when we look at the data. It's basically, you know, as you'll see, it's going to be a 2.6% of a fixed year, you know, it's, it's a particular year's GDP, but we'll see which one. Um, good question, Tom. Uh, so, um, of course, you know, these numbers, like, you know, when, when the paper just says it's 2.6%, you should not just think, oh, it's like, you know, exactly 2.6%, but not 2.7, but not 2.5. Um, because, uh, you know, this is an estimation, first of all. Uh, like, you know, and all estimations are open to, uh, you know, like uh, estimation errors due to the, you know, the presence of distributions and, you know, maybe sometimes omitted variable bias or, you know, a bunch of other sort of issues with the estimations. But still, you know, it is like a number which is not insignificant, to be honest. Of, and also, it depends on, by the way, on some other assumptions, unfortunately, because um, and one assumption is like, you know, one critical assumption here in ending up with this number is the elastic of substitution. Uh, as you all know, like in the utility function, you might be sort of introduced what it is, like, you know, especially if you have a CES utility function, for example, or production function when you have an assist of substitution in the production, on the production side, uh, the estimation of that number might be critical uh, and affect this number 2.6%. You know, that's why uh, an estimation of that substitution is first needed to come up with this number in the first place. Um, so now they also, you know, motivate this like, you know, why like, you know, what, what the main contribution to this paper is to, uh, to the trade theory. There is a very famous paper by Feinstra, you know, one of the textbook writers, which is one of the top guys in international trade field, Robert Feinstra um, from University of California. Um, I think from University of California, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, so, uh, so one sort of mechanism, like, you know, when people think about why the variety is important, like, you know, what is sort of uh, the benefit of having more variety uh, when you think of like, in a, even like, you know, forget about the trade models, forget about, you know, utility maximization problems. Why should we expect that consumers are better off from the introduction of more varieties? So one way to think about like one mechanism that you can um, think about is, is that like, it might affect the aggregate prices. So if an economy opens up to international trade and imports goods from other countries, uh, the aggregate price index uh, might be basically going down. Uh, and then, of course, you know, it's going to be beneficial for the consumer if prices are lower. So that is why, so, so the, the, the mechanism that they are using in this paper is, my understanding is that, that they first compute an aggregate price index, and then they show that, that the, um, introduction of more varieties or import of more varieties from other countries to the US affects this aggregate price index and thereby through that effect it also increases uh, consumers welfare. Of course in order to come up with that price index they need to use some utility functions so they basically you know talk about this like you know which kind of utility function is needed there so this spans Dixit stick this type of utility function is generally sort of the one that is used in this kind of frameworks it is mentioned here in the at the bottom of the uh, of this page, if you can see. And they also talk about you know what kind of data they use. So in trade, you know, as I said, like it doesn't, it's not very helpful if you use, especially for for a, for a paper like this, for example. It won't be helpful if you use data uh, highly aggregate data. That is like you know, for example, data that you can have from word development indicators or um, word development indicators or uh, pan word tables, like we have trade data, like we have imports of countries, like, you know, in an annual basis, like, you know, annual cross country panel data, like for every year, for almost every country, we have data, what the total amount of imports is, what the total amount of export is. But you cannot write a paper, like this paper with that data, 
because it's just you know a very aggregate data like it includes all the goods that is imported from other countries to us and vice versa uh, but it won't be helpful so in for this kind of papers you need disaggregated trade data which is basically you know like how many for example cars or how many specific cars suvs small cars whatever like you know the more of course you know specific it is the better and that level of specification is basically determined by this sort of seven digit or ten digit like you know each product has a code and of course you know you can make it some aggregate codes or very 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 disaggregated codes and of course you know it's much better if you have more and more disaggregated codes so it, if you have you know more sort of disaggregated data uh then you know even with a slight change on the product the code changes at you know very disaggregated level that kind of data is much better of course that kind of data is much more difficult to handle uh you know it's the data set is getting larger and larger so you know so that's sort of an empirical issue but you know the empirical economists are you know generally good to handle those issues um and then so what they show is like you know that there's sort of again one of the results which is explained here that's you know the impact of increased choice on the exact import price index is both statistically and economically significant so the, you know the, the the fact that more varieties are coming in it affects the price index and negatively by the way it reduces it and then it also increases welfare that's sort of uh like you know how much it like they, they also estimate how much it affects the price index and then they also estimate how much it, it affects the welfare of course in order to see how much it affects the welfare you may tend to think that oh you know welfare is very difficult to measure yes okay so measuring the price index is much more easier than measuring the welfare because you know price index is just you know as long as you know the prices and as long as you know how to aggregate the, those prices in a price index in a basket of goods it is easy to measure measuring welfare changes is much more difficult because you know for that you need to specify utility function and you know then you need to convince people that that is the right utility function uh sometimes what people do is that they don't sort of measure that in this kind of papers they don't measure welfare in using utility functions utility levels because again first you need to convince people you know that your utility function is correct that is why sometimes people use consumption equivalence of utility uh so they don't express welfare in terms of the utility but instead they are expressing it you know in terms of consumption overall consumption which is somewhat sort of easier to justify but it's a bit you know too much details like but you know i just also want you to to, to be aware of this then they define what is a variety these are just you know i'm not going to discuss the whole paper in all the 45 pages of the paper but you know i just can show you um sorry um some of the results that they have there are a bunch of good references to the Krugman's original papers like we discussed in 1980 paper in class as you might remember um in the previous two lectures and um so yeah it's basically as i said is an estimation of that uh of that theoretical contribution so then you you see like you know they have you know very nice data set like which basic for example from table one you can see that they can even sort of track down uh like they had for in 1972 for example it was um 71420 varieties uh, of 7731 goods from an average of 9.2 countries so you know so as you can see you know the number of goods is less than the number of varieties because you know uh varieties are basically an extension of course like it's like a car is a good but you know uh, it might be different varieties of cars um and then like you know this was in 1972 and then in 2001 it has gone up drastically uh you know almost i don't know quadrupled yeah tripled more than tripled i can say um and the number of goods is you know more than doubled we can say i think um so but you know this is it really like you know it's just you know, we can just summarize this contribution in one sentence maybe but you know calculating all these is really a tremendous amount of work by the way uh as you can imagine and you know we see these varieties here uh, is a summarized here and 
so a summary is again given here, like how much it can, it has gone up. And then, you know, we also look at the number of course exported to US by country, like, you know, and then try to see like, you know, the number of varieties has gone up more from which country. Like here, for example, fast growing economies like China and Korea, South Korea, rose dramatically in rankings from 1972 to 2001. Here we have, you know, per country, do we have Turkey here? No, we don't, right? No, yeah, we don't have Turkey, unfortunately. Uh, and, you know, you see the rankings. And Japan, you know, has gone down in rankings. Canada has gone up, especially after the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. Like, of course, you know, it went up even before, but, um, yeah. So, and where is China? Can we see China? Here. So, China was 28 in 1972, that it has gone up to 4, being 4 which is really, you know, uh, a big jump, as you can imagine. So, you know, we have like, again, a bunch of data, like in table three, we have for, you know, as in terms of percentages, then they come up with a model uh, that they use to estimate, which is not very, very, you know, a, you know, very technical or, you know, sophisticated model, as you will see. Um, so they just make some definitions like MET be the total imports from exporting country E to US in time T. VET they define as the varieties and then they assume that, you know, there is sort of a relationship like this between the total imports and the number of varieties. Uh, and then, so they will just estimate an equation. So they just assume that this sort of total amount of imports depend on a couple of things like it depends on the size of the exporting country, QE. It depends on the size of the US. Like uh, generally, you know, we will also see that a little bit like, you know, in the, in the second paper, in the border puzzle paper, border puzzle paper, uh, in gravity, so I mentioned the gravity equation to you before. Generally when people, you know, try to empirically model the amount of trade between the two countries, there is this idea of using this Newton's gravity theory. Remember two items like this two one, for example, uh, the amount of the force between them is a function of the size of this, the size of this, and then the distance between these two goods. The more the distance, the lower the force, the larger either of the goods, the higher the force, you know, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the higher the force. So, you know, and then people use sort of an extension and analogy of this Newton's gravity theory to international trade. And like the, the larger the two countries, you know, the higher the GDP of US, the higher the GDP of the exporting country to US, uh, the more is the trade between the two is one sort of assumption. And then the, the higher the distance, the lower the trade. So that is why they have this sort of relationship here. The import depends on the size of these two countries over the distance. And there's a constant number here which is, I think, the Greek letter Xi. And then, you know, when they take, like, when they put this relationship back to the previous equation and then, uh, and then, you know, take the natural logarithm, uh, they basically estimate this relationship. So, which is basically the change in the variety. So, they just write them, you know, in sort of difference form. The change in the variety is basically a function of the change in the GDP of these two goods, as you can see here, right? Because, you know, um, like if these two countries have grown or like, for example, here, the variety that this country, let's say it's Turkey, Turkey exporting to US, the change in the variety that this country, Turkey exports to US is a function of one, uh, the change in the uh, size of Turkey, because if Turkey gets larger, you know, it might basically mean that, that you know, this, uh, that the uh, that's exporting more to, to to US, and then you know they have this relationship here also as well. So this is the error term over here, and then we have this another weird Greek letter, <laughs> which is basically the, like, this basic you know a part you know a part of this equation over here. The size of the US uh, divided by the, uh, the this constant number size of the US the GDP of the US divided by the distance and change of, of course, in distance between the two countries don't change over time much, as long as they don't invade other countries and incorporate them, which is not the case, I think, between Turkey and US. But, 
you know, basically the change in the US GDP history, like, so because the distance doesn't change much. Um, so, and then they estimate these coefficients, beta and gamma, and they see that they are positive, which is like, you know, the results are like explained here a little bit that, you know, holding fixed account is share of exports to US, 1% increase in trading partner size in the size of the Turkish economy, for example, is associated with a 32% increase in the number of varieties exported to US. Similarly, again, if uh, an increase in imports by the US from a country is associated with 35% more varieties exported from that country. So if US grows more and imports more from other countries, it also imports more varieties from other countries. And if the other exporting country grows more, it exports more to US in terms of the number of varieties. Um, so once they have this sort of estimation, so it's just again a sort of a, and as you can see, we are still on the 16th page of the paper. It is just again sort of in a sense a motivation of how variety is affected, that variety changed significantly uh, over time. And then uh, two key factors depend, you know, coming originating from the gravity equation that might affect the change in the variety. And they estimate the utility, they basically, you know, assume a utility function that creates a demand and that creates a price index. I will not be spending a lot of time on this, but I will just be, you know, showing you, these are basically, you know, but what, what they are doing is that they just sort of, from this utility maximization problem, they obtain a demand and they obtain an overall price index. That also depends on the price of the imported goods, which includes a bunch of varieties. And then, you know, they come to the estimation of this using, as I said, this hugely disaggregated data. And, uh, so, you know, you see this section starts in order to estimate the impact of new imported varieties on the price index. Why on the price index? Because as I said earlier, the effect on welfare is basically going through the effect on the price index. Um, and then, here are all the results. So the first, they sort of need to work on the elasticity of estimation, elasticity of substitution, sorry, because the elasticity of substitution between the variety of goods is quite important. How people substitute, for example, you know, an SUV, it may be even coming from the same country, like they say an SUV coming from Germany or a German brand with a smaller German brand car or a larger German brand, a sedan type of German brand car. That elasticity of substitution is quite important. Um, they estimate the elasticity of substitution, and then you know, they also look at you know this sort of uh, specification of disaggregated goods. It's really you know very disaggregated. Like you know, it changes from one specification to another. But you have, for example, the footwear. I don't know, like paper and paperboard, whatever it includes, coffee and coffee substitutes, thermionic, cold cathode, whatever. You know, I, I have no idea what it is, but you know liquefied propane and butane, some sort of, I think, oil product or sort of natural gas type of product, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, so let me just show you the result, the main result here, so the, the, the impact here, overall here. Um, so the impact of variety in US import prices, which is basically suggesting that overall the variety growth implies that the variety adjusted unit price for imports fell it says precisely estimated, but you know, it doesn't have to be precise, but it fell, that's mo the most important thing. 19.70% faster than the unadjusted price. So it's basically, you know, the, the important thing here is that like, these numbers are not really important, whether it's 28, 25, 19.7 or whatever, but the important thing is that it has gone down. So it, it, it is reducing the prices, the overall price index. And then once they do that, we now turn to the cognitive welfare effect of the fall in the US exact import price. So when those prices go down, what is the effect on the welfare? That's what they are trying to do here. Again, of course, you know, in order to calculate the welfare effect necessitates several assumptions that you need to make. Um, you know, some of them are more realistic, some of them are less realistic, but you need those assumptions like the form of the utility function, the, you know, um, the elasticity of substitution, how precisely you have estimated the elasticity of substitution. These are really important because the welfare changes really, really depends on the elasticity of substitution. Um, and then, you know, uh, they go to this and then find that, uh, we find that the consumers are willing to pay 2.6% of their income to access the wires to, you know, this is basically, you know, the gain in the welfare, okay? So um, in 2001, rather than the set available in 1972. Uh, so basically, you know, it's 
the latest so the, when it comes to advanced question earlier question so that 2.6 is basically you know 2.6 of the most recent year um which is a significant change like you know as i said it may not be sort of as significant as you had imagined in the first place but it is not a negligible number and that's sort of the main contribution of this paper basically coming up with this estimate okay uh and i think it's a nice empirical paper again like you know you don't have to you know master all these details of you know estimations issues surrounding the estimations or um you know uh like, you know the details of this theoretical part of the paper however i think it suffices for the purposes of this class to know uh that you know why this is sort of crucial like you know why 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 you know where how variety affects through what mechanism variety affects and of course you know how much it affects uh, in the case of us of course this paper is also extendable to as long as you have disaggregated data to other countries because not only the us but bunch of other countries have also experienced you know uh, more and more exposure to trade from 1970s to 2000s and that exposure came up with an exposure of two more uh, variety of the larger variety of goods and uh, it might also be crucial here in this in this setting anyway so we are done with the discussion of this paper right now now um okay it took actually you know somewhat longer than i expected we almost spent like you know 30 minutes on this uh that so i'm not going to spend that much time for this paper you know but this paper is basically you know a paper i just want you know sort of the necessity why this paper was really needed it's an important paper it's the gravity with gravitas a solution to the border puzzle that you know i really want you to know what the border puzzle is that is why you know i included this paper um you know to to discuss today again because it's it is related to this uh, gravity equation basically so mccallum border puzzle mccallum like you know there's a paper by mccallum in 1994 or 6 let me see was cited here maybe it's cited at the very end let me check it, it should be 1990s but mccallum paper or the or i'm just i just want to try to find the original mccallum paper um here yeah 1995 exactly so john, john mccallum's paper this is sort of the paper that it's sort of you know, referring to that this paper is referring to national borders matter canada u.s regional trade patterns uh so what this paper is basically, you know, this John McCollum's national border paper is trying to show is that, you know, in the gravity equation, we have this, you know, distance between two locations, let's say, that might affect the trade. And then, for example, in the case of, let's say, you know, the trade between Minnesota and Canada and versus the trade between Minnesota and Texas, of course, you know, Canada or whatever the neighboring state, I, I don't really know the Canadian geography quite well, but whatever the neighboring state to Minnesota is in Canada, let's say the trade between these two states, Minnesota and the neighboring Canadian state, um, and the trade between Minnesota and Texas. Now, Texas is much, you know, far away than the neighboring Canadian state to Minnesota, uh, but the trade between Texas and Minnesota is most likely, I don't know the numbers, but you know, that's the idea of the paper uh, is much more than the trade between Minnesota and the neighboring Canadian state. And the reason the yeah, arguably is the presence of the border, even though there are free trade agreements between Canada and US and whatever, that sort of the presence of border creates an effect. And actually, uh, even um, there is that there is a paper, I don't know, I, I don't exactly remember the exact citation, but even um, within the united states if you look at the trade between the states within the us um for example just to make up like i don't know the exact numbers as i said but just to make up a story like you know new jersey is much closer to new york city than say somewhere in upstate new york let's say buffalo um but then arguably there is also you know state border effect arguably that even though you know so the distance alone does not explain so you know then let's say some sort of firm or some household within living in new york city trades or has two options to trade one from a firm in new jersey and then a firm in buffalo you know just because they live in the same state 
it might have some more sort of incentive to trade with the firm in Buffalo. Of course, you know, it doesn't apply. It's, you know, you, you cannot generalize this, this argument, and there are a bunch of exceptions to that. But even you know this McCollum trade board puzzle is applicable to the trade between U.S. states and intrastate trade within U.S. This is called the McCollum border puzzle. Okay, so so basically, you know, the McCollum border puzzle is basically a puzzle against sort of the assumption that distance between two locations is one of the most important determinants. So the puzzle says it is not because you know, distance alone does not explain this because Texas is much far away to Minnesota from this neighboring Canadian province or Buffalo is much far away from New York City compared to Jersey City, let's say. But still, you know, there is trade between Buffalo and New York City. And, you know, so that's sort of the puzzle. And then why? The question is why? Okay, so, uh, of course, you know, there are a bunch of different answers to this question. Also, for example, like, you know, one, um, there are sort of extended gravity models, uh, especially on the empirical side. Um, say, um, like if, it, it's especially true for, for example, the former colonies, uh, like history, for so people argue that history affects trade a lot in the following sense, you know, uh, like most of the time, former the, 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 the largest trading partner, the most important trading partner of former colonies is the, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the colonizing country. Like let's say in the case of United Kingdom, bunch of uh, African countries, let's say, who were previously uh, colonies of United Kingdom, trade heavily with United Kingdom not with the neighboring countries, even though you know, the distance between the neighboring countries is much less. So that, for example, is also an important indicator, like you know, that history matters, culture matters, I don't know, that the two countries share the same religion might matter. Um, uh, so you know, the culture matters, as I said, like you know, a bunch of different things, okay? So that's why, you know, so I, again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this paper, but you know, you may want to look at those paper just sort of with this, uh, border puzzle that I had, I just have explained in mind. Okay, but now, um, so I want to come to this quid pro quo paper as well as to my paper. Now, with this quid pro quo paper, so that's you know I want to spend some more time. Um, so this quid pro quo paper is basically you know it's it's a paper published in Resta in Review of Economic Studies 2015. Again, review of economic studies is, again, most of you might already know, it is one of the top five journals of the profession, another top five journal. Um, and the paper is written by Tom Holmes, McCreighton and McCreighton and Edward Prescott. Uh, you know, the, the, they are all associated with University of Minnesota or Fed Minneapolis. I even took courses from Holmes and McCreighton before. Um, Professor, I have a question. Yes. Okay. What does, what does the quid pro quo mean? It's like tit for tat, like, you know, uh, did, did you follow the news, like the, the, the Ukraine news on Trump, where, you know, Trump was insisting that there is no quid pro quo, there is no quid pro quo between me and the Ukraine. Because in the case of Ukraine, it was basically saying that, uh, you know, arguably, like, you know, the thing was like, you know, the U.S. was giving some aids to Ukraine, the military aids, mm -hmm. with their conflict in, with Russia. Uh, and, but then the sort of the blame was basically, you know, that the Trump has asked for a favor in return for this military help, military aid. And that sort of, you know, what, what, what Trump was asking was, you know, to sort of opening up an investigation to Joe Biden's son, which was who was sitting on a board of an energy company doing some investments in Ukraine or something like that. So, you know, basically, you know, the sort of the idea was whether Trump asked, the question was whether Trump asked, you know, whether Trump tied all these military aid to Ukraine's opening up investigation against Biden. That's sort of quid pro quo. Okay, so in order to get this help, you need to do this for me. Okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, now, um, in this case, of course, you know, it's not Ukraine and Trump, 
in this paper, it is, you know, quid pro quo is basically a policy that China supposedly follows. And I had no idea that China was sort of following this policy. And I don't know whether it's an official policy, but basically it's a policy or implicit or explicit, whatever. It is a policy that requires firms making investment in China, foreign direct investment in China. And, you know, as you all know, like, you know, financial flows can be in different forms. Foreign direct investment is one of them, or, you know, um, like investment in assets, like, you know, in type of in sort of more short term assets is another, another type of financial flow. And of course, generally developing countries prefer FDI uh, more because, you know, FDI generally means, you know, creating employment and generally FDI is long term because, you know, if you just bring some money and invest in government bonds, you can easily go back by selling, you know, just withdraw the money by just selling the bonds. But then you come and open up a factory and you know, employ people and you know, start selling and producing whatever, bring your machines to produce, it's much more difficult to go back, you know, to, to withdraw all these investment. So, because there are a bunch of sunk costs, sunk costs involved. That's why, you know, most of the time, are, you know, obviously developing economies prefer, uh, prefer uh, foreign direct investment to other types of uh, capital flows. But anyway, capital inflows. Now, in the case of China, the idea is that China was following this policy, which was basically requiring the firms uh, who want to make an investment, who want to make an FDI, you know, foreign direct investment in China, to bring some form of technology. So to sort of basically, you know, to get involved with some form of technology transfer. Uh, Professor, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So in this case, China is a host country? Yes, exactly. Uh, thank you. So basically, you, know, you see technology, so the, the title is like technology capital transfers for market access in China. So in order to get access to this market, you know, you bring your, you know, products and, you know, you want to sort of sell those products in this market or, you know, you want to utilize labor markets in China to produce and sell to other countries then the requirement is you need to bring some technology. Uh, and you know, it's understandable, you know, not every emerging market can do that because you know, in order to require such a policy, you sort of need to, you know, your hand should be a bit strong. Uh, and we have a question here, let me see. Professor, does this involve sharing intellectual property with Chinese firms? Yes, to some extent, exactly, because your technology transfer means what? Technology transfer means basically bringing the technology and basically, you know, showing them you know, how to use that technology to produce your own goods uh, and your own brands, okay? And of course, most of the time, you know, some Western firms who want to make FTI, it's understandable that they, you know, they don't like this a lot because, you know, generally when firms come up, especially with a novel technology, they want to utilize and, you know, exploit this as much as they can so that, you know, they can, uh, you know, get all these profits associated with it. Um, okay, so uh, basically, you know, it started by 1970s. I, again, didn't know that before reading the paper. So it says that, you know, which requires multinational firms to transfer technology in return for market access, like as you can see, had become a common practice in many developing countries. Even so I say it had become a common practice, it did not actually become a common practice. I, I disagree with this statement because it is very difficult for smaller developing countries or for countries which are not sort of as large as China to require this, okay? Because, you know, if Turkey requires this, like it's very easy for the Western firm to go to another country because, you know, of course, Turkey is also sizable, quite sizable to some extent, but like, you know, let's say Sub-Saharan African countries or small Latin American countries, Bolivia, Ecuador, it's very difficult, you know, for those countries to require this technology transfer as part of their uh, FDI policy. And then while many countries have subsequently liberalized quid pro quo requirements, China continues to follow the policy in this article, you know, we basically model this, they say. Okay, so they basically model the quid pro quo behavior. And my paper that I'm gonna show next is simply an extension of this paper. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this paper. Instead, I'm gonna spend more time with my paper because I'm gonna show you that my paper is, you know, to a, to a large extent, resembles, you know, the, the, the model that I use in my paper resembles quite a lot the model that is used in this paper. But this paper specifically focuses on, <coughs> on uh, Chinese economy. 
And one thing that I want to show you, so like, you know, you, you can read this paper, it's like, especially the introduction and sort of the um, related literature, you know, all these sort of uh, stories regarding China's FDI policy. These are really, you know, easy to read and not technical, I mean. And they also give you a lot of information on what the policy is about, basically, okay? And there are a bunch of different examples and whether, you know, those sort of requirements are in line with the WTO policies, like World Trade Organization's policies, and so on and so forth. You know, you make like a bunch of, you know, data, whether, you know, it, for example, you know, this, this policy of China affected the number of patents. Like, you know, patents is basically an indicator of technological innovation, right? You know, number of patents issued. And, you know, there are nice data sets for these, and, you know, uh, whether it has, increase the number of patents uh, created in China. So, you know, that's sort of, the, the, sort of the first 12 pages or first 11 and a half pages, basically, sort of this non-theoretical, non-technical, um, uh, you know, discussion of policy. And then uh, the paper starts with the theory. I'm gonna show my paper because as, I, as you see, like, you know, the theory of my paper is almost the same with that, but with a different sort of setup and with, a, with the presence of an informal sector. I'm gonna show it to you. But one thing that I want to show is that it's a really you know, complicated model. It's a model that it is that is impossible to analytically solve. So this this model, like uh, you know, so there is a multinational firm which is running some you know solving a profit maximization problem, has access to different production functions. Uh, you know, this is the capital accumulation equations. And then there is this appropriator, which is the Chinese firm, which appropriates the technology from the investor, foreign investor firm. And it also solves a problem, separate problem. Uh, then there are households. Households can supply labor to appropriator or to the foreign firm. There is this market clearing conditions. And then, you know, the model stops, okay? As you can see, you know, no first order conditions, no theorems, no propositions, you know, no corollaries. Nothing like you know the model is explained here, and then we go to the multi-country application, which is basically the following. You know, you calibrate the model to account to, to match certain facts that you observe in the data, and then you run simulations of the model. That's all. Because that model is you know analytically not solvable. So you can only rely on you know them in, in, in macro theory generally, which is also applicable here. You know, you either can solve the model analytically, you can have an analytical solution to the model, or you don't have an analytical solution to the model. So, you know, here it is sort of, um, you know, you don't have an analytical solution to the model, therefore you need to rely on numerical solutions, which means you need to calibrate the model and then, uh, you know, rely on some simulations, okay? And that is what they do. And then of course, you know, one very sort of important thing here is the choice of, parameters because you know all the simulations that you are going to do here are going to depend on the um, on the parameter values that you choose that is why if you write su such a paper you really need to convince people that the parameter values that they that you use um, are reliable or you know you, you need to justify you, you need to legitimize those values and you need to sort of show that these are not sort of some arbitrary values that you are assuming but they are there either to match some facts that you observe in the data, or, you know, if you have a similar paper, uh, you know, you can take those parameter values from there. For example, in this case, if you read the small note, uh, parameters are taken from McGrattan and Prescott's 2010 analysis of the US current account. So here they mainly focus on US investing in China, but you know, still like they're also looking at other countries investing in China. And just you, if I for if if I were the one to be honest, who has written this paper and use U.S. values here to explain FDI behavior in China, I am 99.9 percent .9 sure a referee would reject the paper, in the, you know, arguing that you know don't, you cannot use those parameters here. But of course, these are you know one of them is a Nobel Prize winner. The other two guys are top economists, so, you know, I, I don't think that they did have a hard time on this, but, you know, it's sort of, yeah, rules of the game. Um, 
And then, you know, they basically like, you know, look at some sort of estimated TFP pads with the FDI, with more FDI, with less FDI, and whether uh, this policy helped China increase its TFP, whether this policy can explain the be behavior of FDI into the China. Uh, actually, you know, for some, you know, here they are, they are trying to sort of see whether the model can help to explain or to account for the evolution of the uh, GDP to China, uh, and GDP of China, the evolution of the GDP of China, and so on and so forth. So, you know, uh, for example, here, share of inward FDI to China from the US, Western Europe, and Japan. So the model the data is here, you know, all these sort of zigzags that you can see, and this is what the model generates. So again, there are no theoretical proofs here. Like you cannot, for example, prove in this paper that you know the share of FDI goes down. Okay, but under plausible parameter values that they assume, they end up with this. So that's what they have. Okay. Uh, okay. So far, so good. Now, again, I'm not gonna. So I'm, I'm, I will be, you know, most, you know, and then the, the rest is basically like, you know, just sort of doing like some simulations and then change different policies. Like, you know, what happens? You can make some counterfactual analysis. So what would happen if China did not have this quid pro quo policy, or if China had relaxed this quid pro quo, quid pro quo policy? I don't know, in early 1980s, mid 1980s, whatever you can do, you can do a bunch of different counterfactual analysis or policy analysis using the setup. Now, what I want to emphasize now my paper, uh, which is you know much easier for me to, uh, or maybe much more difficult to explain because generally people have more hard time to explain their, their, their own research or their own papers. But here, what I'm trying to do is that uh, I want to, uh, first of all, I make an observation. I, and I believe that it's an interesting observation um, that involves FDI, technology transfer, and informal sector size. And then once I make this observation, and I try to sort of justify this observation, legitimize this observation, support this observation as much as I can using different sources of data. And then uh, after sort of trying to justify this observation as much as I can, I uh, construct a model which is similar to the model that you have seen, not much, but you, know, you are gonna see it much more here. It's, it's a very similar model to this Restart paper by Prescott, Holmes, and McCretton. Uh, and but I extend the model with an informal sector because I have informal sector. And then I try to see whether the model simulations that I will show you can account for the uh, empirical behavior that I try to justify in the beginning. Okay, that's what I do. So here I just show, you know, in, you know informal sector is, you know, quite uh, large, substantial, like informal employment accounts for about 70% of employment in a typical market, emerging market and developing economy. It is large and, you know, it's what I try to argue is that if you, um, if you omit informality from any type of analysis, like, you know, if you want to do analysis with, you know, between growth and inflation, growth, the sources of growth, or you know, about tax policy, whatever. If you omit informality from your analysis, your results are gonna be misleading, especially for developing economies where informality is quite prevalent. And similarly here, like especially for FDI, I argue, or I try to argue, I don't know how well I argue, but I try to argue that uh, informality is quite important, especially in the context of FDI, because uh, one of the main sources of informal informality, informal sector, is um, tax evasion, or and as well as uh, the lack of enforcement of intellectual property rights. So, Professor, I have a question. Yes. How did you get this informal sectors data? Oh. Uh, so. There are a bunch of different data sets of informality out there. Uh, in this paper, I use my own data set that I have constructed using a DG model, dynamic general recovery model. Uh, with, um, in a World Bank project, uh, we have a paper now, working paper. Hopefully it's gonna be published soon. Uh, we have constructed this huge data set of informal sector size, annual cross country panel data set of informal sector size 
for more than 150 economies uh, all around the world in an annual basis. And so I use that data, but there are uh, there is one more relatively large panel data of informal sector size by Friedrich Schneider, from a professor from Austria. And his method is the mimic method, multiple indicators, multiple causes method. So there, is, you know, there are data sets. Of course, you know, informal sector size by definition is hard to measure. You know, the governments can't measure it. How can I measure it right, as a researcher? But there are different methods that have been developed in the literature. One of the methods I really, you know, contributed quite substantially to develop this method that uses the dynamic general equilibrium, two sector dynamic general equilibrium model. You know, yeah, so I use my own data, but you know, the results don't change much if I use the Schneider's data as well. We can, okay. Later on, we can talk more about the sources of the data. Like, you know, it's not the key thing here, uh, but for now, just believe me that there are already established methods that measures the size of the informal sector. Some people call it shadow economy. So they say we are measuring the size of the shadow economy, but it's essentially the same thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now here, so maybe this paragraph is sort of key here, uh, which is like we are using different data sources. We first show that the technology transfer effects of FDI are more pronounced in countries where the informal sector size is relatively small. Again, the first sentence is maybe quite important. That's actually what the, the, the observation that I try to justify as much as I can. Again, let me tell you, the technology transfer effects of FDI are more pronounced in countries where the informal sector size is relatively small, which basically means that more or less in countries where the informal sector size is relatively small, FDI translates easily and more to technology transfer. Whereas in countries where informal sector size is large, it does not, okay? So of course, in, order, so in a sense, like, you know, suppose you have data on the technology transfer effects of FDI, okay? You know, if you have data on technology, of course, that data is very hard to obtain, but suppose you have data on technology transfer effects of FDI, and then suppose you put it on the y-axis, and you put FDI on the x-axis, okay? Uh, what I say is that in countries where the informal sector size is small, the slope is positive, Whereas in countries where the informal sector size is large, the slope is negative or not positive, I can say. Uh, so that's sort of, in a sense, you know, one way to put this. But unfortunately, as you'll see now in a minute, this is very hard to empirically justify. Because as I said, like, how do you measure technology transfer effects of FDI? Of course, you know, technology, you know, you can, you can measure technological improvement, like number of patents, number of, I don't know, academic papers, number of R&D spending, you know, level of R&D spending and so on and so forth. But then the question is, how are you gonna sort of see what fraction of this technological development comes from FDI? Because, you know, what you want to measure is the technology transfer effect of FDI, right? So, and it is very hard to measure. So that's why, you know, and I can't directly measure, unfortunately, that's one of the sort of, uh, you know, problems with this paper, in my opinion. Uh, but I try to show some evidence as much as I can. And let me show you how what I, what I do here. Uh, so there is this uh, World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Index, okay? So first of all, like I, I sh if you look at this second section of the paper, evidence on FDI informality technology transfer nexus. So I, I have three sections, 2.1, 2.2, 2 2.3, and I said, like, I provide three lines of evidence. The first one is coming from aggregate cross-country data. So how, uh, what I do is that I look at the word, we have, we have this word economic forums global competitiveness index. And so they are just, you know, doing some surveys to a bunch of people. Uh, and then, uh, so one component of this index is coming from this question. To what extent does FTI bring new technology into your country? Now, of course, it's a perfect question in my, for my purposes, you know, it is exactly, you know, what I'm looking for, right? Like how much FDI translates to technology. But of course, you know, the, the issue with this question is it is very subjective. You know, you can ask me, oh, to what extent does FDI bring new technology into your country? I would say, ah, oh, from one to seven, I say six. But you say seven, but maybe we mean the same level. 
it's very new because it's like you know the, the, the sort of the categories are like you know from not at all one to a great extent seven. But you know what I mean by to a great extent and what you mean by so so okay you know might be the same thing I don't know so yeah, it's very subjective. Uh, and of course, still, like, even if we mean the same category, we may be mistaken, you know. How do I know? I'm, I'm a professor, like, you know, I was a professor, in, I, I'm, I'm a professor in Turkey. Like, even if you ask me, like, you know, how much does FDI translate to technology transfer in Turkey, I'm a professor of economics, even my answer would be very subjective because, you know, who knows how much, right? So even the government does not know how we can, you know, right? So that's why uh, it's a very sort of problematic data, but still, you know, it's good data. Like, you know, it's sort of at least, you know, one of the data sets that I can use, data series that I can use. And here, I just, you know, look at this plain correlation. Uh, I hear this effect of FTI to technology transfer as measured by this index. You see like from one to seven, there is no country one, like, you know, most of the countries are starting from 2.5 or so. Uh, and then we have the informal sector size on the x-axis. And you see like, you know, there is a nice, not very striking, but nice tech, you know, negative correlation. This is a plain correlation, of course. Uh, and then I think I should, yeah, I am also running some regressions. So this is a panel data, by the way. I don't remember from which year to which year, but yeah, okay, it's, it's covering 11 years from 2007 to 2017 and covering 137 countries. So it's a panel data, this WEF data. This is just, you know, the, the, the time series averages of each country. So each square is, or each, each diamond, I think, is a uh, country. And it, it basically reports that, that that country's average value for all these years. So this is the average informal sector, whatever this country is, for example, here, it is the average informal sector size of this country. And this is the average, you know, this sort of subjective value between all these years for that particular country. This is just to illustrate plain correlation, and I also run some regressions here, panel regressions, fixed effect regressions. I use some IV regression with one period uh, lagged uh, independent variables used as instruments for the levels, which is, you know, again, a bit problematic, like, you know, oh, I have a question. Uh, uh, okay, what is the question? I understand we are talking about technology transfer from one country to another country. Does that exist a similar discussion regarding highly skilled educated human capital, which could be important in conducting certain research rather than technology for, so you mean like, no, don't be sorry to interrupt, like, you know, this chat uh, box is just, you know, for this kind of questions. So, but what I don't understand is like, are we asking about um, like, you know, brain drain, like, you know, human capital going from one country to another? Because there, there are a bunch of papers on brain drain, uh, actually, if you are asking about that. So similar discussion regarding highly skilled human capital, which could, you know, in, yeah, so you, what you are arguing maybe like, you know, so this sort of technology transfer does not happen alone, like, you know, yeah, brain drain, okay, yeah. Of course, brain drain is, there are, there are several papers on brain drain, like uh, the effects of brain drain and, you know, how we can sort of stop it or reverse it. Like, you know, uh, there are some even like brain drain tax arguments. I think Bhagwati, you know, Jagdish Bhagwati from our department had some idea about this, like this Bhagwati tax, which was basically, you know, a tax on brain drain. Very hard to implement by the way, but, uh, but there are also some papers by the way, maybe, you know, at some point, if time permits, of course we can discuss, maybe, you know, the next paper that I can discuss might be about that because it just reminded me of something like when I was a second year PhD student and I was taking this international economics course from Tinkiho, the first quarter, um, you know, we were supposed to come up with a research idea by the end of the quarter, by the end of the seven weeks period and make a presentation about that idea. And I, we have, as a group of three, we have chosen, uh, an idea related to brain drain. <laughs> and we had this idea about that brain drain might, might actually be a good, even for the country that is draining, you know, that's sort of sending all these brains to the other country. Why? But then, but the one unfortunate thing was that we, we work about this idea, but then we realized that there's a paper, already published paper on the idea in Journal of Development Economics. That was unfortunate. 
But the idea was brain drain can be good a good thing even for the sender country because uh, you know let's say like in Turkey people are let's say you know highly educated people go to other countries to Canada to US to Europe whatever and of course you know one immediate thing that you are going to argue is oh it's a very bad for Turkey but then of course you know the idea was if you know some people who cannot immediately go to other countries so just because there is sort of this opportunity or possibility of going other countries going abroad start you now assume that those guys start to invest in their skills say you know let's say you know i just sort of think about going to this i'm a you know high school graduate and you know i stay i study in a community college or in a two year sort of associate degree type of uh, higher education institution and then i you know i see all these people going to canada and i say okay i want to go to canada i want to go to ontario and but for that i need to learn french so let me study french first so then i go to a french you know i go to a, you know uh, to a f you know, french education program or whatever in, in my country in turkey i study french i learn french so i invest in my human capital but then i don't go you know suppose because some of those guys won't be able to go even though they made all, all these human capital investments, they will not all, you know, they, so not all of them are going to go abroad. Some of them will stay. And then that sort of just this sort of presence of this opportunity may increase, may under certain conditions, may increase the average human capital level of people who stay in the country. Then that might be beneficial uh, for the overall human capital level of the country, maybe, you know. So, that, that was the idea, but you know, then we found out someone already published on this idea. Uh, so anyway, so this is the panel data regressions in which I also show that, oh, there's another question. Uh, I think, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so now this is the um, panel regressions in which I basically show that if you look at this row, of course, you know, we can also discuss other uh, rows as well, but you know, whatever regression you do, you know, the informal sector seems to be negatively correlated with, you know, the higher the informal sector, the lower this subjective, uh, you know, index value. Okay, this is my first. Uh, professor, I have a question about this table. Yes, of course. So, uh, so what are the other uh, independent variables? GDP per capita is uh -huh. institutional yeah. quality index, which is actually a measure of, uh, uh, it's basically sort of an average of different indices that aim to measure institutional quality. It is explained in the paper. And openness is trade openness. It's export plus import to GDP ratio, how much the country is open to international trade. And this is simply the lagged dependent variable in the GMM regression, dynamic panel data regression. Uh, okay. Okay. Then, okay. Uh, no, thank you. So then, um, I have, I go to the second sort of type of uh, evidence, which is the firm level evidence. Now, it is, so the firm level evidence basically, you know, relies on the data from the World Bank enterprise surveys. I don't know whether you are familiar with this, but this is a really a very rich data source that you can use, World Bank enterprise surveys. Firm level surveys, they are repeated every three to four years in a very large number of countries, 139, to be exact, and covers you know, at least the one, because they are adding more and more data sets every month. Like I received two or three days ago, I received an email, for example, like it, which said, like, you know, we included, you know, three more surveys from these and these countries. Uh, so they, you know, increase data set every now and then. But at the time that I run this analysis, which was early in 2019 or, you know, uh, spring 2019, summer 2019, you know, it was covering 125,000, uh, 125,000, uh, you know, uh, firms. Okay. Um, so what I do here is, oh, sorry. So uh, one thing that I forgot, sorry, I'm sorry. Like before going to the firm level evidence in this cross country evidence, I don't stop here. So I just, you know, I report this, the panel regressions, but I also report some regressions with, in table two, which is here in which I regress patents and industrial designs per millions of people 
on several things. Uh, let me also show you. This is again a cross-country panel regression, which is uh, not firm level regression, cross-country panel regression. Now, what I do here is that I look at this patterns and industrial designs. This is available in world development indicators of World Bank for millions of people. It's a sort of, you know, a measure of technological improvement, not technology transfer, but technology improvement, which basically shows the following, you know, so I regress this on FDI, and I regress this on informal sector times FDI. I'm gonna tell you why in a minute. It's an interaction variable. And then other controls, like, you know, like dependent variable, trade openness, institutional cost, the GD per capita. But one important thing here is the following, you know, if you look at these two columns right now, what you see is that FDI is positively correlated with if informal sector size is zero, independent of the informal sector size, you know, suppose it is zero. FDI is positively correlated with patterns and designs per, you know, per capita. But as informal sector size gets larger, that positive correlation is reduced. Because, you know, the, you know, based on this equation, the derivative of the dependent variable with respect to FDI is this number, or this number, I'm sorry, this number, plus this number times informal sector size. And since this coefficient here is the, the coefficient of the interaction variable, we call this interaction variable, interaction between informal sector and FDI is negative. It means that when informal sector size gets larger, this positive correlation between FDI and patterns and industrial designs is reduced. Okay, actually depending on the informal sector size, it may even, you know, reduce to make it even negative or zero. Uh, I don't remember, you know, how I measured in from like in percentages or not, but you know, that's sort of how you should read interaction, co uh, estimated coefficients of interaction variables. It changes the slope or it may change the slope, okay? Basically, that's important. Uh, okay, now, by the way, I also look at the you know, relationship between FDI and informal sector, which turns out to be sort of a U type of relationship or almost zero relationship. So there is no particular relationship between these two, which is not really important at this point. Now this, this is another, of course, again, this is not directly measuring technology transfer. It just measures technological improvement. If you just, you know, think that this is a nice measure of technological improvement. But now when I come to firm level evidence, I use this World Bank Enterprise Survey. Now, again, unfortunately, the World Bank Enterprise Survey don't measure technology transfer or informal sector, you know, is sort of, in a, you know, as clear as I want, but still they provide some measures. What kind of measures? Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, we, we use four dependent variables in four regressions, I say. One of them is, one of the four, like there are, these are firm surveys. So they are asking questions to firm representatives you know, general managers, managers, owners, whatever. One question is, does this establishment at present use technology licensed uh, from a foreign owned company, excluding office software? Like, you know, exclude, you know, it's not really technology transfer if you use Excel or Word, whatever. But, you know, does this establishment at present use technology license from a foreign owned company? Which is, you know, I don't know, some measure. Again, during the last three years, has this establishment introduced new or significantly improved products or service? You know, did it make an innovation basically? During the last three years, another question, has this establishment introduced any new or significantly improved process? Not service or good, but you know, process. This includes so on, you know, this and that. And finally, during the last fiscal year, did this establishment spend on formal research and development activities either in house or contract with other companies, excluding market research surveys? Again, like, you know, do I, are you engaged with some sort of research? You know, research, yeah. Yes. And then I regress this on some variables. So I regress this, all these four, so I call them technology variables. One, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. So in each regression, one, two, three, four, all of them are technology variables based on the answers to these questions. Uh, and then I have some independent variables. What are those independent variables? So as I said, like there are three regression, regresses. Regresses is independent variable, basically. There are three regresses in these regressions. 
The first one, this is what I mean, foreign partnership, measures the percentage of foreign partnership. Like, because in this surveys, they also ask firms, you know, what is the percentage of foreign ownership in your firm? So it is basically a proxy for FDI, you know, because if there's a foreign ownership, it means, you know, money came into this firm, made some investment, and, you know, again, not very perfect measure, but a measure. Then the second variable is this informality variable. We also need to know what, whether the informal sector is, you know, engaging in informal economic activities. Unfortunately, as I say here, there is no direct measure of informal. You cannot go and ask the firm, are you informal? This is a very stupid question. Like, you know, if you ask the firm, are you informal or are you evading taxes? You know, are you paying wages below the minimum wage? No firm is going to answer these questions truthfully. So they don't ask these questions, of course. But what they ask is that a very indirect measure, to what degree are practices of competitors in the informal sector an obstacle to the current operations of these establishments? Because generally the idea is, I am not the only one which is using this question as a measure of informality, a firm level informality, people are using it. But again, it's very hard to justify, I believe. Um, because like, it is like, in a sense, if, a, if other firms are an obstacle for you because they are informal, you also tend to engage more with informal activities. That's the idea. There is another question like, does this establish compete against unregistered or informal firms? I obtain similar results. So I also use this as, an, as my informality measure. And then I use the interaction between the two, you know, the product between the two. And then what I show is that foreign ownership is positively associated with technology variable because all the coefficients are positive and significant here. But interaction between informal sector and foreign ownership, and you know, the, the effect of this interaction variable on the technology variable is negative, which is basically, you know, it's very similar to the previous table indicating that the higher the foreign ownership, the larger the technology variable. But when this informality tendency gets larger, that positive correlation goes down. Again, it's another evidence. I am sure that it's not perfect evidence, but it's an evidence. Okay. Okay, so far so good. Now, uh, I, let me just come to the model um, in which, as I said, I'm very, I am using a very similar model to Prescott Holmes, like uh, Prescott Holmes, McGrattan. Now, let, let me just you know, quickly describe the model. So it's a multinational firm. In, you, know, you, you may want to read this model you know, more carefully if you are interested in those. I'm not going to ask you in the exam or in a, in, in a quiz, like, you know, write down the model, solve the model. You can't solve the model, by the way, as I said. You can only numerically solve it. You can analytically solve it. I'm not going to ask this kind of questions, but, you know, you may want to just know the general idea here if you are later on, especially if you go to PhD, interested in this kind of theory. So it's a multi, there is a multinational firm which maximizes the present value of its after tax worldwide dividends. So this is the dividends for the firm. The, 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 the firm is incorporated in the home country J, making, making investments in host countries I, a bunch of other countries. Like, I don't know, Siemens, a German firm, making investments in China, Turkey, Egypt, you know, whatever. Uh, of course, these are taxed these uh, dividends in the home country, they are taxed. Okay, and we have this arrow double price PT here. Uh, you know, we can drop it, doesn't matter much. Uh, then, um, so what, what are these dividends equal to? You know, what, what is the source of these dividends? That's sort of the complicated part, somewhat complicated part. So here are the, where the dividends are coming from. Of course, all these dividends are coming from different countries because Siemens made investment in Egypt, in Turkey, in, Brazil in China, as I said. Now, they are basically profits. Okay, so dividends, the main source of the dividends are profits. But the firm, this investor firm, can make investments both in the formal as well as in the informal sector. That's my assumption. So the formal sector profits are here. Okay, so this is, you know, all these, you know, term in between this parenthesis is the, you know, the formal sector profits. Like, you know, this, this is a formal sector output in country J, formal sector labor wages, and then, you know, investments 
There are two kinds of capital goods. That's why there are two kinds of investment. You'll see some of, some of the investment is not taxed, tax deductible. That is why it's outside of the parenthesis. But the non-tax deductible part is here and you are paying some taxes, profit taxes or corporate income taxes for those profits. I'm going to explain, you know, the differentiation between two capital goods in a minute. But then there is also this informal sector here. I call it shadow sector. Y S, Y sub S denotes the shadow sector, the informal sector. Y sub F denotes the, denotes the formal sector. One important distinction is that the for the uh, informal sector, the shadow sector technology, you are still paying corporate taxes, but these corporate taxes are subject to, you know, it's not tau, it's rho times tau. And rho is a number between zero and one. Generally, you know, you, you, you have seen this before, like, you know, rho is generally taught as a tax enforcement parameter. And, you know, if it is zero, you know, you are not paying any taxes, basically. If it is one, you are paying taxes as much as in the formal sector. Of general, it is between zero and one. Because even very informal firms pay some amount of taxes. That's why it is not maybe zero, but close to zero. Uh, of course, it may change from one country to another. Row I may change. That's why it says a subscript row. Uh, it, it, it is a subscript I, sorry. So all these, you know, um, notations are explained here. Now, you may want to look at this sort of uh, two different kinds of capital which is M and T, okay? And of course, you know, they also have subscript F and S. F means formal, S means shadow, okay? Uh, and then T is like, you know, T stands for the tangible capital, because now, again, I am following uh, Holmes Prescott and Holmes Prescott, McCreton, I always forget her, McCreton. Um, it's, the model is similar, except that they don't have the informal sector. So we have this, you know, formula informal sector technologies, YF, YS, the tax rates are given, rho is given. Now taxable profits for the formal sector is equal to the formal output less wage payments. Uh, and then depreciation of formal tangible capital, KF, tangible capital is like, you know, machinery, equipment, like, you know, the, the capital that you can, you know, hold in your hands. But then there is also, you know, the investment in intangible capital, which is, you know, brand name, advertising, right? That's the intangible capital. And then we also have specific to the investments in country, I, we have technology capital. So we have three kinds of capital here. Technology capital, tangible capital, intangible capital. Again, it follows, the model follows um, the, uh, the model, the, the, the rest of paper. And then the production functions, since we are now, you know, slowly out, running out of time, we have this production functions over here, the formal sector production function, the shadow sector production function. Um, shadow sector uses tangible capital and labor, whereas the formal sector uses intangible capital, tangible capital, and technology capital. Now, the thing is, you may want to ask, like, you know, so as you can see, evidence from the form of the functions, the formal sector uses a constant terms scale production technology, employing formal labor. So the formal sector inputs are formal labor, Technology capital, tangible capital, intangible capital, four inputs. On the other hand, informal sector uses to be less capital intensive and more labor intensive in previous research. And here I assume that it uses a decreasing terms of scale production technology with only tangible capital and informal labor. Now, you may question this assumption. Why does it, informal sector doesn't use intangible capital, technology capital? Intangible capital is easy to justify. You know, you don't generally see big brands and, you know, advertising of informal production. So, you know, of course, there might be some legal, but you may omit it for the sake of simplicity. And technology capital, again, like, you know, of course, it doesn't mean that the informal sector does not use any technology at all. But it is not, you know, informal sector firms are not making investments, large investments in their technology capital uh, to improve their technology, whatever they use, they generally mimic, so from the formal sector. And even if they do a little, you know, inf intangible and technology capital, that might be captured as a fixed capital in the TFP parameter. So it, it doesn't really, you know, for the sake of simplicity, you can use that. And then you may also ask me, why do, you, why do I assume that the informal sector uses a decreasing total scale production function? It does because uh, if it doesn't, 
So the, the decreasing torsion square production function basically means uh, that it has positive profits at the end. Uh, it is needed because uh, otherwise, when the you know the TFP levels are very high in the formal sector, informal sector size may be zero. If you have a decreasing torsion scale production function and end up with positive profits, informal sector size in the model simulations never becomes zero. That is why it's a shortcut that people use in this type of two sector models. Um, and they use this decreasing torsion scale technology for the informal sector so that it doesn't reduce to zero. If it is if both of them are constant torsion scale, one of them, and most likely the informal sector one, might get reduced to zero. And, but there is no country in the world which has zero informal sector, so we don't want this. So we want it to be um, always positive. Now, what else to discuss? Ah, okay, so this uh, sigma, which is also important. You know, you see the sigmas here, these two sigma parameters here. In, so we have this TFP parameters, which are the A, A, F, A, S, but we also have this sigma parameter, which is explained here. Sigma is a parameter for the degree of openness of country I to FDI by multinationals from country J. Okay, so you know, from for their own companies, it's always one. But for you know, for, if a Chinese firm is making an investment in China, Sigma is one. If a Turkish firm is making an investment in Turkey, Turkish multinational firm making an investment in Turkey, it is one. But if a German firm makes an investment in Turkey, it is less than one. You know, it might be bureaucratic barriers, you know, some whatever the barriers and whatever sort of uh, factors there are to affect uh, FDI. That's also important. And then anything else? Let me see. Uh, ah, okay. So then, if you look at this capital accumulation for the technological capital, it is assumed to follow this equation where Q is an important term and Rho is an important term, which is, so this day, the, the, the original restart paper has already Q here, I add the Rho as well. It is basically, you know, technology capital accumulation. It's a very simple, you know, capital accumulation equation. Capital tomorrow is equal to one minus depreciation capital today plus investment. So capital tomorrow is here, one minus depreciation plus capital today is here, but we have another term over here in the big parenthesis, which I'm gonna explain plus investment. So it's a usual capital accumulation equation, except for the presence of this term over here, okay? Which is now basically depending on the, so here I explained it in the following paragraph, okay? Why we, why we need this, okay? So like if you, the, the idea is like, as, as it can be seen from the, let, let's read this together. As can be seen from the above equation, next period capital technology, depends on two factors. The first factor is a non-depreciated capital from the current period. And the second factor is a new investment in technology capital. Standard capital accumulation equation. However, so you know, I explained this, using technology capital in country I requires transfer from some technology capital to local firms, quid pro quo assumption. So this transfer is represented by this function H. So since you transfer it, like it is as if like you are losing it a little bit, okay? So these three guys, like, they interpret this function as broadly capturing quid pro type of quid pro quo type of policies such as forced joint ventures. Like, you know, if you want to do this investment in China, you have to get a Chinese partner and do it together type of forced joint venture. Um, and that is why they say this function H, which is, you know, entering negatively here, as you can see, it is increasing in Q. So when the firm brings more technology capital, it has to basically, you know, the higher the, the higher the intensity, uh, the, you know, uh, the more the you know the transfer. Q is by the way this Q parameter is basically not parameter, it's a variable. It's a variable that the multinational firm chooses, a choice variable. It is the fraction of technology capital allocated to country, country I. There is a typo here, country I. So the multinational firm from country J decides on what fraction of technology capital that it owns to allocate in country I, that is in period T, that is it, okay? So that's, you know, uh, of course in your country, it's always there, but for other countries that you are investing in, it is between zero and one. Of course, you can bring all your capital or not. It's not a rival good, you know, when you bring your technology, you don't need to divide your technology between different countries. So the only question is how much of the technology that you know 
are going to bring to to the to the to the to the to the host country. I also assume that, in addition to what uh, Holmes, McCrate, and Prescott assume, I also assume that it's a function of raw, the tax enforcement, because I think that this parameter raw is not only tax enforcement; it is a you know legal enforcement, you know contractual enforcement, the sort of how well the internet international property rights are defined. It's basically sort of the legal environment which is measuring the legal you know the enforcement quality okay that is why uh, in addition to being weakly increasing in the intensity of technology investment q similar to the holmes mccrath and prescott paper i also assume that the function is this is my little, another novel extension of the paper by me is it's also decreasing in the enforcement parameter row when enforcement is high you know when enforcement is you know, the legal environment in the host country is better, the institutional quality is better, then H is lower, meaning that, you know, sort of, we subtract less from the current capital, which is better for the multinational firm, which is making an investment. So it's not only tax enforcement, but it's legal enforcement as well. So, you know, I, I, I said, like, we interpret this parameter in somewhat broader way and assume that it also captures the degree of law enforcement, blah, blah, blah. Uh, professor, I have a question. Yes. So, uh, like the firm own the investment 100 percentage or the share shareholder with the other country? The firm owns it. No, oh, firm. Firm is owns the uh, yeah. Owns yeah. Yeah. And we had, you know, we had this uh, capital accumulation for tangible capital in all the sectors, like they add up to the total capital in the country. These are standard asset market clearing conditions or capital market clearing conditions. Then similar to the, again, Holmes paper, Holmes McCrat and Prescott paper, I also have this local firm that they call appropriated, appropriated firm. I call it local firm. So the local firm is also here. The local firm can also use uh, shadow and formal technology, informal and formal technology. The, for, the local firm also has two production functions as defined here. Um, yeah, so you know that's sort of more or less the same here. Ah, one thing is that when the local firm uh, appropriates technology from the foreign firm, um, then when it enters into the production function of the local firm, it is somewhat discounted. You know, if you know a Turkish firm appropriates some technology brought by Siemens to Turkey and starts using it, it cannot use it as efficiently as productively as Siemens. So you know. Of course, you know, you can change it. Like it's a parameter, this psi between zero and one here, which enters the production function here, as you can see, the formal production function, which uses technology capital. I don't need to have it in the in, in informal sector because the informal sector does not use technology capital. Uh, okay, so far, so good. And local firms capital accumulation equations are also defined. Then I define the household's problem. Households maximize utility, you know, they choose consumption, leisure, you know, this utility of labor is here, consumption's utility is here, the budget constraint is here. You know, standard budget constraint, we are almost done. You know, we are running out of time. Maybe I can spend a few minutes in the next lecture on this. But what I do is that, um, so once I define the budget constraint, now I need to define my relevant variables. You know, even though I'm not gonna analytically solve the model, I'm gonna again rely on numerical simulations. I need to define what variables I will use, you know, in those simulations, what variables to particularly look at in those simulations. So I define, for example, invert FDI to country I in this model setting like this. The invert FDI is basically, you know, the sum of all the tangible investments from all possible countries divided by the formal uh, output of the all the foreign firms investing in the country and the local firm. So defined by equation one. Again, so in the denominator, because in the data, I only have FDI as percentage of GDP. It's cross country data, for example. But how, what does it mean FDI as percentage of GDP? So I need to have GDP here on the denominator as per, to make it as percentage of GDP. But what is GDP? GDP is all the formal outputs of the multinationals plus your the, 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 the formal output of your local firm. I don't include informal output here. 
because inform now, but by definition, it's outside of the government scrutiny. It is not included within GDP. And then FDI is, you know, bringing machinery equipment, you know, into the country, right? So, you know, this is basically, you know, the change in the uh, tangible capital that this multinational firm from country J brings to the country. So that's it. All the multinationals. Because, you know, there, there might be more than one. Then the informal sector, because I also have data on informal sector as percentage of GDP. How do I define it in the model then? In the model, it is, you know, the informal output of the multinationals plus informal output of the local firm divided by formal output of multinationals and formal output of the local firm. This is another key variable. Finally, how do I measure technology transfer? Rate of technology transfer. Because, you know, remember, I want to, I want to make a regression using the model generated variables. I want to regress, for example, technology transfer effects of FDI on FDI. And I want to show that when informal sector size is low, it is positive, you know, the correlation. When informal sector size is large, it is not. Maybe it is negative, maybe it is less positive, you know. I want to show this in my simulations. But how do I define technology transfer then in my simulations? This is the definition here. The technology transfer is basically, you know, the appropriated technology capital of the local firm. All these tilde variables are the local firm to differentiate it with the multinationals divided by that capital plus all the broad technology capital uh, for the other for from the from the multinationals. So this this second term in the denominator is how much technology capital multinationals brought to the host country plus the appropriated technology capital. And in the numerator we have the appropriated technology capital. Of course, one another way could be, you know, I have similar results, you know, instead of having this technology capital on the, in the denominator, I could have formal, I could say, you know, just express it as percentage of GDP, you know, appropriated technology capital divided by GDP. You can also do that. The results are more or less similar. Okay. Um, so, yeah, when I, once I define all these, I proceed with the simulations. I use a bunch of data. I calibrate. I'm not going to go into the details. You can read it on your own, but I calibrate some of them. I match some of them. I, I directly obtain data. I, I do some, you know, two type of analysis. I um, I don't have a lot of data from, you know, or it was quite difficult to, you know, run the analysis for a bunch of countries. I basically focus on two particular countries, US and Turkey. And I calibrate the model separately for US and Turkey. Uh, for the US ones, I use McCrate and Prescott papers, uh, the values, because they are calibrating their own model for US as well, the original model, not the Restart model, Restart paper, but the, the previous state paper that they were citing on in their own papers. Uh, of course, there are some complications regarding sort of how to estimate this H equation or what kind of a functional form to use. These are, you know, com some complications, but, you know, let me just show this nice results. This is for US, if I am not mistaken, these figures from the simulations. Now, okay, let me try to read. So here in figure figure three, I have enforcement on the x-axis, enforcement going down, meaning informal sector is going up, okay? Enforcement and informal sector is, you know, directly related to, to each other. So when enforcement goes down here, when we go to the right on the x-axis, informal sector, as you can see from figure four, increases. So you can just think that, you know, you can replace inform enforcement with informal sector size. But what do I have is that, so I have technology transfer here on the, on one of the y-axis and FDI as percentage of GDP on the second y-axis. What I see is that this technology transfer effect of FDI, whatever, you know, because here technology transfer, the only source of technology transfer is FDI. When informal sector size gets larger when you go to this direction, it goes down. Okay, so it is more here, less here. And also, another interesting result is that in this region, so the, 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 blue, the blue one is the effect of FDI, by the way. The FDI follows a U pattern with informal sectors. It does not necessarily go down or go up because more informal sector at the same time means, uh, you know, 
less taxes. You know, we are paying less taxes on informal output. So it might even create more incentives to bring to, for, for firms to bring more FDI. Of course, FDI here can come up in the form of tangible capital. And it is, it is defined in the form of tangible capital. Now, the question is, do they bring this tangible capital more to the formal sector or to the informal sector? It changes, you know, when you increase the enforcement, so, sorry, when you reduce the enforcement and therefore increase the informal sector, FDI first goes down, but then it starts to go up. Because now I think like, you know, in, informal sector is becomes more and more profitable and they bring capital, they bring tangible capital, which is the definition of FDI, but they use it more and more in the informal sector, which is not using any technology. So that is why, you know, FDI declines here, then starts to go up. Uh, so in a sense, you can say, oh, we have more FDI, but that FDI is not translating to technology because that FDI is, that FDI from multinationals going as tangible capital to informal firms. So that's sort of the main idea. This is for US. I also do it for Turkey, simulation for a different economy. Uh, I use Turkey because, you know, it's one of the, you know, among the 38 OECD economies has the largest informal sector size with Mexico. I, you know, do, you know, some analysis with respect to Turkey as well. Uh, here, <laughs> enforcement is increasing. Okay, because why? Because here, what, what I try to do is that, uh, I calibrate the initial US economy, which is an 8% GDP, informal sector as percentage of GDP. I calibrate it, assuming that rho is equal to one, I remember, and then I, you know, reduce rho and see what happens. For Turkey, I calibrate the initial model for rho equal to 0 0.325, because Turkey is a 27% informal sector. And then I, you know, increase rho and see what happens. You know, what would happen in Turkey if you have more you know, you know, legal enforcement and, you know, contractual enforcement and institutional quality, whatever. Again, similar results. Of course, FDI declines and goes up uh, later on with more enforcement and technology. But, you know, the nice thing about Turkey is that, you know, maybe the level of FDI does not reach the level of initial FDI. Okay. So this is a very sort of interesting result because, you know, now what is the you know, objective of a government here? Is the objective of a government maximizing FDI or maximizing technology transfer? It depends because, you know, sometimes, you know, you don't need technology because, you know, FDI means employment. If your concern is employment, for example, then you may say, okay, I don't want to maximize FDI. You know, I want to maximize, so I don't want to maximize technology transfer, but I want to maximize FDI. In that case, you may end up here, but, at, which means that then at the same time you have to accept the lower level of technology transfer. Or you can be here, for example, in which you have less FDI and most likely less employment, employment gains, but more technology transfer, which might be better for the future or maybe not even, I, I don't know. So, you know, I sort of have, I, I run these kind of simulations. I do some, some simulation with taxes, you know, what would happen if you reduce labor taxes? what would happen if you reduce corporate taxes, you know, so on and so forth. You know, I, I, I do some additional analysis like, you know, whether uh, changing the taxes also affect uh, the outcome here. But yeah, now, yeah, I think it's a good point to stop here. So maybe we can discuss these two figures in the beginning of the next lecture in which I will present another paper and hopefully one of you is gonna present a paper uh, we'll see. I will send you more details about this. So, and I, I will try to make this, I recorded this and hopefully it is recorded well and I will try to make it available on Courseworks if you need any of this. Maybe I can even post it on YouTube to, to show you, you know, my first online lecture, to illustrate my first online lecture. If those guys, you know, who have asked questions are okay with it, uh, I can do that. Uh, so, yeah, I think like it was a fruitful lecture, even though it was done remotely. And I really, you know, I'm about to lose my voice. Like, I think I talked much more than usual. Uh, and I, but this is one of the downsides of the remote lecturing. But thank you for um, staying with me here for about one hour and whatever, 45 minutes or so. Uh, and I hope it was a useful lecture in which we have talked about several papers. 
uh, and I will send you, you know, we will communicate via email uh, as usual uh, until after spring break. And for sure we will be doing the lecture, continue doing the lecture after spring break with, in a remote basis. And I was supposed to, you know, also post the homework today, which I will do hopefully in the afternoon. And, you know, you are gonna, maybe I will sort of increase, you know, sort of the time you know, the due date, I can postpone the due date of the homework, the new homework a little bit. I will decide on that sometime today. And once I post the homework, I will let you know. Now, do you have any questions? Any questions? Yeah, there is a chat box. Let me see. Could you upload the highlighted research papers? Of course, yes. Okay, the highlighted ones, I will. Okay, because you know, the ones that I have uploaded before were not highlighted. <laughs> So yeah, I will upload the highlighted ones to Courseworks, okay? Uh, don't hesitate to contact me again, as I said, via email. We will keep in touch through this and I wish you a very pleasant spring break without any exposure to uh, COVID-19 or, you know, this coronavirus, whatever. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Uh, and yeah, okay. Have a nice day, have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye.